This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week, joining us from Portugal is composer Stephen Snowden, currently on a Fulbright scholarship, um, doing sweet interactive media things, <laughs> as far as our Google Doc goes. <laughs> Steve, thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. We'll assume so that are, it's like three, because we're Americans and don't know anything about geography. We'll assume yeah. that it's like three o'clock in the morning and we're making a huge imposition. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not so bad. It's, uh, I think, uh, five hours from Eastern time, six from Central time. All right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the middle, middle of the afternoon. afternoon here. Yeah. Cool. So what, uh, what brings you to Portugal in your, in your Fulbright? What are, you, what are you working on over there uh, other than oh. generically sweet interactive things? <laughs> yeah, and other than drinking, you know, delicious Lots cheap wine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm uh, I'm working with the uh, University of Porto um, Engineering School, and uh, I'm basically just doing some research on ways to um, facilitate collaboration between music and dance. So using motion tracking, um, uh, using sensors, uh, that that sort of thing here. Um, so it's uh, it's it's been pretty interesting just working with the uh, PhD students at the university because they um, they have a. a a media studies program, a uh, PhD program, basically that that is all about collaboration between the arts using technology. So there are visual artists, um, uh, there are musicians, but everybody has like sort of a programming background. And for me, I'm I understand that stuff fairly well. I don't consider myself a programmer, but I'm very comfortable with Maxim SP, which a lot of programmers would say it's not even really a you know it's not a like scripting based language or anything. It's it's right. pretty rudimentary. Um, I still think it's pretty awesome. But uh, so that's what I use to translate things. But um, uh, yeah, I've been doing some research into that and um, trying to coordinate some performances. It's been a little bit uh, um, difficult to get as far with that as as I would like to. My initial plan was to have some performances in. Porto and in Lisbon, and I already contacted choreographers and uh, musicians that were going to set some things up. And in Porto, it's uh, in Portugal. I'm, I'm living in Porto right now. In Portugal, it's sometimes it's, uh, um, you know people. It's a little bit difficult to get projects started because say, well, maybe we'll do it next week. We'll meet for lunch. We'll talk about it, and uh, then and then you meet for lunch, and like you don't talk about it because you're eating delicious fish and yeah. drinking wine, and like, well, okay, next week, next week, we'll 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 get to it. But uh, part of it also is um, uh, just the distance because I'm on the other side of the country from uh, Lisbon, and the main choreographer that uh, um, that I really wanted to work with is down in Lisbon, so it's a little difficult to coordinate those things, but. Regardless, um, there's a lot of interesting things going on here in terms of uh, technology and uh, the engineering school all in all is just uh, uh, really uh, quite wonderful here. So this is interesting to me that you are uh, you're working so you're working with engineers specifically well, to, to do this stuff. Um, yeah, basically, I'm I'm working with people who are more programmers than I am, uh, but these are people who are. Um, trained musicians to some degree. Uh, some of them are really excellent. There's um, uh, one guy, Gilberto, who's an uh, uh, excellent sax player, uh, who also is an excellent programmer that um, uh, that's just very knowledgeable about things on both sides. So they're able to help kind of translate some of this stuff. And and uh, and basically, I'm, I'm trying to come up with ideas to make it things a little bit more elegant to um, make the, um, rather than just a sort of novel exploration of the technology, trying to use that to build um, to build something that can really facilitate artistic collaboration. So rather than just like, hey, look at this cool new thing, it's like that cool new thing is just one more tool in the bag that we can use to make some great piece of art. That's a really delicate line to tread because some of this, like as <laughs> yeah. a tech junkie myself, some of this stuff is so interesting and, and you can really get wrapped up in the, in the technical details and stuff. I know, and it's and it's really hard to. Um, I guess you know we, we go through the same sort of thing as composers. It's like I could do this, and I really want to because it's really cool. But then you have to step back and think, okay, is is this really necessary? Is this just going to muddy up the waters and and uh, you know not really serve a, a you know serve the piece of the performance uh, or, or the piece of music uh, in the way that uh, that it really should? Sometimes you just got to leave those ideas behind. So yeah, yeah, that can be tough. That's great. How how can we? Uh... Like I imagine, at some point you'll probably be doing some kind of performances or some kind of mm -hmm. posting of your work. How can we follow up on what you're doing out there? 
Um, probably just on my website. I think I'll probably um, I'll probably add a little section to my website once uh, once I put together some performances. Uh, my guests that will be uh, taking place in Austin. I, I've worked with um, I've written a lot of music for dance, and there are um, a couple of choreographers in particular that I've um, worked with pretty frequently. They're very open minded and, and interested in trying new things like this. So uh, I'm sure at some point at one of the many modern dance festivals in in Austin. Um, we'll probably have a premiere of something that uh, um, sort of the fruits of this research, um, and then hopefully other places as well. I, I'd really love to come back to Portugal um, and uh, and do something here. I feel like I've made a lot of contacts and a lot of friends, and uh, uh, it'd be it'd be great to come back. Excellent. So, <clears throat> I know you've been in Portugal, and even from Portugal, you were in Hong Kong for a little while. Is that right? Yeah, I was there for a couple of weeks, and this was, um, it was a really interesting program. Um, I don't know if any of you had heard about it before. Uh, there was like a call for scores, basically, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's called The Intimacy of Creativity, um, which uh, I, I, I don't know, I still don't know how I feel, how, how I feel about the, uh, the, the name of it, but regardless, um, it was an excellent, excellent festival, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, the artistic director is Bright Shang, um, and um, and then there are several people that are sort of coordinating everything, organizing things. And it takes place at the um, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, um, and uh, basically it's uh, um, composers and performers get together. Um, the performers rehearse the piece. They have suggestions about how you could change things or or what you could do, and there are also these open discussions where there's an audience, like a live audience for the rehearsals and they basically give their input about the piece and uh, like maybe they're not trained musicians but they might say, well this seemed like a little too long or this you know was uh, something um, and after that we would go and try to make some revisions and come back for the next rehearsal and uh, try those things out and then do another open discussion and they, they were quite big too, there were maybe two or three hundred people in these um, open rehearsals um, wow. Most of them were students at the at the university, and they were kind of shy. Um, but uh, then the performances were um, really excellent. I mean, I was working with a quartet called the um, Quartetto di Cremona uh, from Italy. Uh, they're a professional group that's been together for um, about fifteen years. Um, and uh, pianist um, Nolan Pearson, who's in Chicago, um, and just really excellent performers. And uh, the the shows sold out. The the the, uh, the concerts sold out. I think they were. Three hundred Hong Kong dollars um, for a ticket for the concert, which sounds like a lot, but that's actually like thirty euros, which I guess be I don't know, thirty five, forty dollars. So that's still pretty pricey, um, but uh, people were really enthusiastic about it. Um, so uh, yeah, there were um, I guess five composers. I think f five of us there, um, like five uh, fellows, composer fellows, and uh, we all went through the same process and. Um, Edgar Meyer was there, um, also Jimmy Lin, violinist Jimmy Lin, um, and um, a couple of younger uh, musicians as well, Katie Hyun and, um, uh, and Nolan Pearson. Um, but it was just a really ex excellent group. And I thought the most interesting thing about it really was learning a bit about the music scene in Hong Kong. And because I really had no idea what was going on out there. I feel like basically anything that's happening in Asia, I really just don't even, like I can try to read about it or something, but I really don't know what's going on out there. Um, but I found it to be really encouraging. Um, the, um, I, I had a, an interesting conversation with a journalist uh, who's been working in Hong Kong. He's from New York. He's been working in Hong Kong for, I think, around 10 years. And um, I think he put it pretty well when he said that uh, there's this sort of imbalance that's creating an interesting climate right now in, in Hong Kong in that uh, in the West um, you have a, a lot of um, cultural capital is what he was saying so a lot of prestige a lot of famous performers and uh, and uh, sort of long traditions uh, in classical music and in the e uh, but no money so in the, like in the United States and, and and in Europe I mean there's there's money but like relatively uh, compared to Asia there's all kinds of money. Um, but there isn't that same sort of uh, tradition, and they're interested in bringing people out. So, uh, for instance, you know, just bringing out the entire New York Philharmonic to Beijing, or bringing out um, uh, you know famous performers to to do things, uh, composers, and and commissioning new pieces, and um, 
so there's there's a lot of activity there, and there's a lot of interest, and uh, I found that to be really encouraging, and especially Hong Kong because it's a very um, uh, westernized city uh, in a way because of the prolonged contact, obviously, um, with uh, the UK. Um, so um, yeah, I just I, I found that to be uh, really interesting, and it was a fascinating place to be. It's also a very big city; it's about eight million people, uh, and it's very tall. It's a lot of very tall skyscrapers and um, yeah, it was, it was cool though. Now you were, you were probably in kind of a special situation with this festival with Bright Chang and uh, these, these, uh, amazing composers. Mm -hmm. Did you perceive any difference in attitude between, um, uh, old dead guy, classical music and new music in Hong Kong as opposed to the United States? I did not experience that in the same way. Um, I, I was only there for two weeks, so I can't really, sure. um, you know, I, I only have like sort of a glance at, at all that. But um, from my experience, it, it was kind of like people just saw it all as a, as a part of the same tradition. So um, there's a lot of classical music there as well, like old school classical, you know, Beethoven, Bach, all that sort of thing. Um, but I think with new music, I, I didn't get the sense that they really saw it as anything all that different other than it's just newer. So it's like you have... You know, Bach, Beethoven, Stravinsky, uh, you know, Bright Shang. It's like they're all just part of the same and then continuum Steve. in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. Um, so you, you said, you, you talked about the kind of the, the, this different process that you went through with, the, uh, with, with this, this piece. I was wondering if you could uh, maybe explain what made the resulting piece different than than the the way you normally work um i mean for me for me it wasn't it didn't feel all that unfamiliar because anytime i'm writing i i contact people a lot about like if 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 i have a commission I, i'll be in close contact with the performers that are going to be premiering the piece throughout the process and ask a lot of questions because when it comes down to it as much as I read about the bassoon and and like look at orchestral excerpts and solo lit, uh, I'm never going to know as much about the bassoon as a bassoonist. So I just need to ask them uh, and work with them. Uh, and in this case, um, working with the performers, uh, it was interesting with this Italian group too because they play a lot of new music and they're, I think maybe because they're European, they're more more used to to just doing exactly what what is asked of them and just figuring out how to make it work. Um, like we had discussions about uh, Lockerman about you know all the difficulty of, of trying to get that together. He's kind of a special case because he's Lockerman, you know, actually can show all the players exactly how to do the techniques and that kind of thing. But um, it seemed to be at first maybe a little bit uncomfortable for them to make suggestions about the piece. Um, but um, uh, but in the end, I think it was a good process. I didn't end up changing that much. I actually added maybe. 15 seconds to the end of the piece that um, that, that I had there, um, and tried out some other things that didn't really work. <laughs> we got to it in rehearsal. And I was like, uh, "Nope, I, think I went the wrong direction there." <laughs> that seems that's a that's a theme. It's that's the second time that you you've talked about trying things and finding that they don't work and taking them out. And I think yeah. that's that's an interesting thing. I, I think that's a lot something that at least I am always reluctant to do. I don't know yeah. about about you guys, but it feels like. Man, I've worked so hard to make this thing so good, and but you're right. It doesn't. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And, and, it, and if it makes the piece better, you should take it out. Uh, but that's yeah. a, it's a hard thing to do. It's it's so hard to do. Yeah, I mean, you feel like it's it's like uh, um, you 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 feel just a, a, like this sort of affection towards this thing that's you know this idea. Your, your that's baby. Like, it's your right. baby. Yeah, and you don't want to just get rid of it, but it doesn't really serve its purpose within it's, the piece. It's just misunderstood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll so, happen. Like, <laughs> for me, that, it's just that, like, oh, I'll cut it out and then put it to the side and I'll use it later. And most of the time, I don't end up using it for anything later, but it makes right. me feel better about it. Right, right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. That problem actually hinges. Sometimes it's awkward because, um, you know, technically, you, you think it might work if they were to execute it just right. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have to decide whether or not it's worth the effort of getting them to do that and whether or not you're wanting them to get it and make it work just because you don't want to admit that you should cut it out or not. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that. I think that, that brings up kind of a good um, – we're sort of 
moseying over to a, a, another another topic that I think is it might be of interest to composers, and and it's the uh, the way that I've been collaborating with um, performers online, and I think other composers are doing this as well. I don't know exactly who, but um, but I've been really into making blogs um, recently, and I don't know if you guys had gotten a chance to check out the um, uh, the blog for this consortium commission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the thing I really like about that is I can I can ask about a, a technique or I can po I, I can post like a few measures of something and say, hey, is this really hard or is this impossible or you know how does this feel? Um, and I can get immediate response, um, and that's been really helpful. And I think we probably have a we'll have a, a link to um, to a, a PDF of of one of the pages of this thing because it's a it's a sort of uh, the the blog that we have is kind of a, a closed forum for uh, for the performers and for me to discuss all these things. I figured it probably wouldn't be good to just yeah. post it. It also has PDFs of the piece and all that. Um, but uh, if you can see from uh, um, from the uh, PDF file that you just have of the web page there, um, I, I've, I've posted, uh, I'll just post questions about notation, about um, technique, uh, even like programmatic ideas, um, musical ideas, just as I'm going along. And again, it's it's a it's about sort of swallowing my pride and posting something and saying, oh, I think this would be a really cool to go direction to go with this piece. I'll try this and then this, and then like three days later, posting like, whoops, nope, that didn't work at all. That that was a dumb <laughs> idea. But leaving it up there so people can kind of see how the piece has unfolded over time. Um, and I think that's for me the um, uh, like during the process for me, what's really helpful is getting that immediate feedback from them. Uh, like I remember Boeing something or Boeing. I remember posting something about Boeing and harmonics uh, for vibraphone on there, and within an hour, um, Thad Anderson in Florida uh, emailed me and said, "Hey, let's Skype and we can talk about it. I've got 20 minutes free, um, and I've got my vibes here." He just set up his computer. He Skyped. I recorded the whole thing, and uh, uh, and so I could go back and, and actually see him doing the technique because I don't have an easy access to a set of vibes here. Mm -hmm. But having that immediate feedback is is wonderful. But instant. It's never a problem it's, with having different kinds of talent levels, um, like engaging in the blog too. I mean, you can, you're pretty much always sure that these people are are very good at what they do. Yeah, well, and even if they're, I mean, for instance, this um, this one in particular uh, is is a very large consortium. There are, I think, 32 players all together. Um, wow. So it's it's a lot, um, but it's really cool. It's um, um, with something like this, I think they're all chipping in a little bit less than if it were, you know, like a six-member con consortium or something like that. But there are lots of people involved, um, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited about. Um, uh, you know, lots of performances mm -hmm. and getting to know. I mean, I don't know most of them personally, but uh, the the lead commissioners, Tim Brionis and Mike Truesdale, uh, have done an amazing job recruiting people. And being you know, it, with any of these, um, you know, instrumental worlds, they're pretty close knit. So uh, they just like. Call their friends up and send some emails, and then lo right. and behold, we got a bunch of people that join the, the consortium. But with this, there's a there's a really wide range. So you have some people like uh, Nancy Zeltzman or uh, Pedro Conero who are like seasoned professionals. They've you know uh, been around the block. They uh, um, uh, they're you know they, they've had you know long professional careers already. All the way down to some undergrads in there as well. So there there are definitely different experience levels and different uh, playing levels, but um, everybody can see the piece. Unfold so as it goes along. Um, I feel like one thing that's actually helped me with is um, with, uh, with with deadlines. Partially because I'm I'm posting things like as I go, so I think okay, I should really get this little chunk done so I can post that today. But also, as it approaches the deadline, the performers are already really familiar with the piece because they've seen all of this coming up. Like they know my system of notation already because they helped me create it. Um, and what that really does, what I think one of the biggest benefits is, th is that the performers feel a real sense of ownership of the piece, which they do. I mean, they, they helped create the piece. So um, they, I, I mean, uh, it, it, rather than just like buying something at a store and like, oh, here's some, you know, random piece. It's like they feel some emotional attachment to it. They feel some sense of ownership, um, which I think, you know, in the end uh, probably results in maybe better performances or more performances or, I don't know, just a, a nice sort of, lasting connection with with uh, with performers yeah and that'll be i mean for those undergraduates that'll be a thing for their whole careers they'll be able to perform that piece over and over again and for them yeah. you know that, that this is this is kind of my piece that i that i helped make uh so yep. that's a really cool thing i'm this is and i'm glad to, to hear your story about that it's something that, that we've talked about uh 
on the show before is making those connections and and how to collaborate across space and time with the people that we work with and it, so it's really I I love the idea of the blog and some of the posts on here are, are really interesting um and I, I think it's something that should should catch on I wish I wish yeah. there was maybe even an easier way that people could set up their own thing like this like some mm-hmm. kind of some kind of project blog platform thing there probably is if you know something like that and you're you're listening to my voice let me know send us I think a some two. people tend to use um social media a lot to ask questions mm. about these sorts of when they're composing a piece you know going th- you don't really quite get the whole story of its composition um yeah. but you know it's it's a, social media is great for that sort of thing too well and also mm. this is like an insular thing this isn't like an open yeah. to everyone thing this is just for right. the people that are commissioning the work which is another cool aspect of it so yeah, how many of these, have you done a bunch of these before steve yeah i've probably done maybe 12 of them wow uh 10 or 12 um and most of the time it's i mean this is the first uh consortium uh thing but um uh usually it's you know an ensemble where there might be you know six seven eight players and uh, everybody has their own login and I, I do it all with wordpress yeah um and i have um a, a lot i have like 500 gigs of hosting space so um, I've got all these things just sitting on there and um, and it's it's pretty straightforward I've never had any problems with uh, people not quite being able to figure out how to get in there and and, uh, and make comments or make posts um, but uh, yeah it's even with the just a smaller ensemble when it's not a consortium thing it's still really helpful because I can uh, for me I really I I'm coming to the realization that I, I really like to document things. And it's not even necessarily document things to like show other people. It's just I like to have, you know, I like to sort of go back. Maybe it's because my memory isn't so good. <laughs> I like to be able to go back and see exactly how things unfolded. And uh, with something like this, it's like every, you know, every day, every couple of days is, is it's sort of a snapshot of what's going on. Um, and, uh, and then the performers can also go back to that. I mean, I, I have some that are uh, on, on my, uh, like some of these blogs are, I guess I started doing this three years ago, two year, two and a half years ago, I guess. Um, so the you know the players can go back if they're interested in seeing how things came about with uh, with the piece. Um, yeah, but it's it's also just kind of it's really helpful for me right now being in Portugal. I've been here for almost nine months now, wow. and I'll, I'll be leaving in a couple of weeks. Actually, I'll be heading back to Austin in a couple of weeks. But um, during this time, I've written a few pieces for people who aren't here at all, so I haven't had any like face-to-face contact with them but we've done everything online and it's worked out pretty well yeah that's great that's great it's a question i was going to ask is like it seems like you you're able to work in a couple different formats of doing this work with your fulbright in portugal of working with these engineers and really talking different languages and trying to make art in that way Mm -hmm. and also doing these uh this kind of consortium with a bunch of people talking back and forth on a blog and really having this daily interaction building a piece but then also going to a festival where you might just bring a piece, show up, plop it down for them, and then have the interaction from there. Do you feel like this all works the same way for you, or do you have to like really shift gears to to work in these different ways, or is it? Um, I I feel like it all kind of works the same way. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I I I never really thought about it. Um, before, but um, there is a lot of, I mean, strangely, like being here in Porto, there, this is a city of about one and a half million, so it's, uh, it's pretty good size, but it's not a, it's not a very, it's not a really big city. Um, and there are, you know, some good musicians here that I've been in contact with, but uh, it's not, uh, um, it's not like being in London or, or even in Austin for me, like I, I feel like I know a lot more musicians there and, and I have this face to face interaction with people all the time, especially other artists. That's a really important thing to me, for me. I, I am inspired by um, other disciplines a lot, so I love to go to like modern dance concerts or to go to a gallery opening or something like that. I find that that really inspires me, and to be able to talk with these artists and go through the struggle of communicating what it is that we do, because we have a yeah. different language. It's not even just the language that we use to express ourselves, like music or painting or whatever, but it's actually the way that we talk about it. It's totally different, so yeah. with dance, um, uh, it's... It, it's frustrating at times, but I, I actually find it to be really wonderful to try to talk about um, basically music, what I would consider to be musical concepts, musical ideas. It's, it's, it's some form of expression taking place over, over a given time. 
Um, but the way that they used to describe things is totally different. And I feel like I get a different perspective on what I do just by trying to communicate with them about that or going to a dance rehearsal, like working with the choreographer and going to a rehearsal and realizing it's like, oh, this is like a jazz combo or something. Right. It's, you know, they've got a basic plan for what they're doing, but they, you know, they adjust everything according to their dancers and they move them around and they sort of build it in place. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess, uh, I feel like I'm inspired by communicating with a lot of people. And fortunately, because of the technology that we have right now and, and, um, uh, you know, even being in a situation where I'm on the other side of the ocean here, I feel like I've been in constant, steady contact with with people all around, and I, I haven't felt um, isolated out here at all. That's great. Cool. So we, um, we, we oh, go ahead, Sam. Well, I just had a question about um, uh, this. Kind of involves education. Um, I was wondering if, in in trying to do collaborations with people, where you use a blog. As an example, have you felt any resistance, uh, perhaps from the older generation, where they don't want to engage with that kind of a tool uh, as a collab to, as a means to collaboration? And uh, do you have any thoughts on whether or not we should be inspiring uh, student composers to engage in this kind of stuff as a way to organize projects? Well, I, I suppose it's um, I I have never had any any experiences where people. Uh, we're resistant to to doing a blog, but then again, I'm mostly working with with performers that are around my age. So he's he's working with an enlightened group of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's it's usually people in their uh, you know maybe late thirties at the, at the most. Um, it, you know these are young performers, um, so it's it's kind of second nature. I think part a big part of it is just social media. We're used to getting online all the time, seeing what everybody's up to. You check your, check Facebook, you check Twitter, you check the blog that, you know, this dude's writing a piece and you check that out and see if he's posted anything. And it's just, it's just part of, um, just maybe it's kind of second nature in a way. Um, I, I think that, you know, maybe for some people it might, it might not work all that well. For me, um, doing this kind of blog thing uh, is, uh, just works like for my personality or, or whatever. It just seems to work pretty well for me. For some, it may not. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, there might be something to be said for having you know uh, a real period of uh, sort of isolation in a way where you're you know doing the more kind of traditional composer thing where you just go off by yourself and you work on some music and you work out your you know uh, all, all the technical things and all that. I mean, I, I'd spend some time doing that as as well, but it's it always seems to be in kind of chunks and then I post some things online and, and usually, you know, most of the stuff early on when I'm talking about musically what I have in mind, like nobody even responds because they don't, like what are they, they don't really know what to say about it. It's like, oh, well, I was going to have this uh, slow movement and then have this uh, Chilorando here and it's, then it, usually the response is like, cool. Um, so, I mean, there, <laughs> there's not necessarily so much input uh, in the process there, but once it starts getting into the um, sort of practical things, um, there's a lot more. But, I think that maybe for young composers, I think that in maybe every case, maybe all cases, or at least most cases, um, communicating, interacting with performers a lot, I think, is really important um, because uh, I mean it, it gets you past the. Um, if you can get to the point where you can really imagine what it's like to play this piece and like what it's like to be the performer, like try to think from their perspective on the stage. Um, and, uh, and, you know, is this going to be awkward? Is this going to be really fun? Is this, you know, whatever. I, I think that that adds so much. Um, so, um, I, I think that maybe a blog type approach might not always be the, uh, um, the best way to go, but, uh, I, I think that having constant contact with, with other artists, artists from other disciplines and with performers is, is, is really important. And I think having a background in performance I mean, for some people, it works to not have a background in performance. That was another thing with this um, festival in Hong Kong, actually. Um, a couple of the um, other composers, there's um, Carlo Margedic, uh, um, who's from uh, New Zealand. He plays clarinet. He played on his piece uh, that was performed. Uh, Roger Zare played piano on his piece. And then Charles Halka. I don't know if you guys, if you know any did, of these guys. Did but... Roger Zare do the uh, ping pong piece, ping pong ball piece? No, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one was, uh, this was a piece for um, clarinet, cello, and piano. Um, oh. Yeah. 
Um, but uh, and it was interesting too, actually, the, on these concerts. In uh, and we're just totally going back to the beginning of the conversation here. Um, uh, these concerts would have all new music in the first half, and then some big piece. Uh, this year was uh, Dvorak for both of the um, uh, both of the main concerts. There was uh, um, like all new music, and then Dvorak um, uh, bass quintet, um, or the, there was also the piano quintet. Um, and Bright played the piano in the, in the piano quintet, and then Edgar uh, Meyer, who was there as a as a guest artist, as a performer and a composer, played bass, obviously in the bass quintet. Um, and uh, there was something about uh, there was a lot of emphasis on 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 composers being familiar with with performance or being performers themselves. Um, and, uh, and Bright was really emphasizing that all the time that um, uh, that it's it's an old concept. I was afraid he's, he's like the old becomes new. It's like this is an old, a concept that's so old that we're bringing it back and now it's new that a composer must be a performer. And, in, you know, in the past, a performer, you know, to be a composer, you had to be a famous performer before people would even take you seriously. Um, so for myself, I'm a horn player and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not the horn player I used to be, but I still do perform. Uh, and I do feel like it's, it's important to have that connection. It's important to, to know what it's like to be up on stage um, and to be playing and, and, uh, and to be able to basically empathize with your performers. And in this kind of thing, when you have this interaction, whether it's a blog or whatever else, um, uh, I think having, uh, um, having that time to, to interact with performers and really get to know what they do and ask a lot of questions is, is really important for young composers and old composers and everybody in between. Um, I mean, there's a reason. I've always had good experiences with that too. There's a reason that these people have chosen this instrument. That they're still playing it. Like, let's say you're at the uh, college somewhere. Um, you know, nine times out of ten, they're going to be really excited to talk to anybody about you know the tuba. Like, go talk to any tuba player and just say, "I want to learn about the tuba," and they will you know talk to you for hours about all the fun things that they like to do. And you know, they they've chosen the, to play. They chosen to stick with it and lug that thing around for a reason. They they actually <laughs> love playing the instrument and they love to tell people about it. So, um, yeah, that's great. So it sounds what, what I'm getting from you in this conversation is that you really overall just love working with other professional musicians, which is great. That that. It, and it comes across in the music. Uh, you know, obviously, you've got these kind of interactions that are very, you know, goal oriented and project oriented, professional conversations. But it seems like you also really love that social thing. You know, when, you, when we talked earlier about the difficulty of getting work done when you're in in Porto, uh, yeah. <laughs> and your your description of having that conversation with that tuba player is great because it's both of those things, right? You're working toward this very specific goal of creating this piece that I includes some things that only tubists or percussionists would know about, but then you're also just really reveling in the the passion that this other person has uh, in another way we might describe it as the, the their their nerdiness you know their their dorkiness uh, which is <laughs> yeah, we're which all, is great we're all nerds when it comes down to it yeah right oh, yeah <laughs> right. What is the uh, what is the John Hodgman thing? Never, never, never downgrade another person's dorkiness. That's it's 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 wonderful <laughs> to to revel in those things. That's great. Yeah. So Steve, I was uh, curious to hear about um, fast forward Austin. Um, I wonder if you could just tell us about that because it sounds like a very interesting project to me. Yeah, yeah, it's um, uh, it's been wonderful. I guess we've been we've had three. Um, marathon festivals so far. So we've been around, I guess, about four years. Um, we started planning the uh, uh, our first one about a year in advance, and uh, it's uh, myself and Robert Honstein and Ian Dickey. Um, we all have a, an Austin connection. We're all composers, and um, uh, Robert lives in New York now, and um, uh, Ian is actually in Stockholm. Uh, he's. It was kind of weird how it worked out, but we started at UT together. Um, we started the DMA and composition together. Uh, we started this festival together, and then we both got Fulbrights the same year. And he's in Stockholm, and I'm in Portugal. Um, wow. But we've been doing things remotely this year. So in in Stockholm, me in Portugal, Robert in New York, uh, and luckily we have a lot of uh, very um, uh, very kind and generous friends in uh, in Austin that have helped us out with um, getting some of the things, some of the some of the basically boots on the ground um, hmm. for a few things. Uh, so. 
Um, yeah, we, we started this uh, um, four years ago um, and just wanted to have uh, a festival that was presenting what we thought was really exciting and awesome music in a way that would get lots of, like, get people there that wouldn't go to a concert hall. Um, so um, one of the main, I mean, we, we want to have, like, really high quality, high caliber performers. And we, we've been, you know, lucky to work with a lot of wonderful people uh, the past few years. Uh, and to put it in a, in a place where people can, you know, they can sit in a beanbag chair and drink a beer or stand around and, and listen to, you know, Steve Reich or Jevsky or whatever happens to be performed. But they can listen to some, some pretty intense uh, music or just very diverse, uh, um, awesome music and, and be comfortable doing it. Yeah, it sounds like a perfect fit for uh, Tristan Parrish, who I see has participated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a friend, he's a of, friend of our show. Friend yeah. of the show. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was wonderful having him this year. Um, me and Perkins' duo um, premiered um, a piece of his called Parallels. I hope I have that right. I think it's Parallels. Um, and it's a piece for um, tuned triangles. I think it was six tuned triangles a piece and a hi-hat a piece uh, and electronics. So he had speakers hanging behind. This is uh, uh, how a lot of his pieces are. And it's all one-bit electronics, so it's run from a chip basically, rather than uh, from a CD or anything like that. Um, and it was great to um, – actually came to the um, UT Electronic Music Studios and talked to uh, some of the students. We, we set up some things with the university so that the performers that come in – like last year we had Vicky Chow from the Bang Out of Can All-Stars. She came yeah. and did a – Friend of the show, Vicky Chow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, she she did some stuff with the composers about extended technique for the piano and all that. But um, this year, uh, Tristan uh, talked to the um, composers in the Electronic Music Forum uh, at UT and talked about his process and his music. And we even got down to the nitty gritty. And and uh, there was even a little tense moment where uh, you know he uh, he and uh, Russell Pinkston, the um, uh, one of the professors there that runs the Electronic Music Program, kind of got into it back and forth about some terminology about some things. And it was it was really <laughs> wonderful to have this conversation. It was great. And it was a really awkward conversation. <laughs> it was it was a very nerdy conversation. Yeah. Did, did they start screaming at each other in binary? <laughs> zero one one zero zero. Uh, no, it was great. I mean, afterwards, uh, 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 Russell came up to me. He was like, ah, "I was just playing devil's advocate." I was like, "I totally agree with you. I just wanted to kind of push you around a little bit and kind of get some good conversation going." But um, it's just a little sparring. Yeah. yeah. A little nerd sparring. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, this piece, um, it was 30 minutes, I guess, about 30 minutes. Right. Um, so it was a big piece. It was their entire set, um, and it was the premiere. And we also, we, we also had the, the Austin premiere of Music for 18 Musicians this year, which I was okay. kind of surprised that it was the wow. first time it's ever been played in Austin. Yeah. Um, but uh, we talked to the publisher because we, we hadn't even considered, <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> we, even, we haven't really considered that it could be the, the premiere. We thought, well, maybe. So we, we emailed Boosie and Hawks, and they said, oh, wait, as far as we know, it's never been played there. We talked to Dan Welcher, who's been in Austin. He's a composer in Austin. Uh, he's been there for uh, 30 years or something. I mean, basically as long as that piece has been around, and he hadn't heard it either. So had the had the premiere mm -hmm. of that. Um, we had, uh, let's see, Squonk, um, their bass clarinet duo out of yeah. uh, San Francisco. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're killer, man. They're they had badass. Hit they really are. <laughs> Yeah, um, which is I, not something of, you usually associate with bass clarinet, by the way. I know, I know. It's um, uh, yeah, it's totally unexpected because they're very mild, mild mannered guys. You know, it's like suddenly they put their bass clarinet in their hands, and they become superheroes or something. Um, <laughs> and uh, we had, <laughs> yeah, um, we had another duo from uh, San Francisco called the Living Earth Show, uh, who has made the the single greatest Kickstarter video ever. Uh, like uh, uh, that I've ever seen. Um, I, you guys could should definitely check it out. They were they were raising money for um, to build a quarter tone vibes. Um, Whoa! For for some uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the video is just is is amazing though. It's just uh, it's hilarious. So um, I can't even I, describing it wouldn't do it justice. Um, we also had uh, the Weird Weeds, which is an Austin group. It's more of like a rock group. They do this kind of I don't know uh, trance prog, hard to describe kind of stuff. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and uh, oh, we also we also had the Convergence uh, Vocal Ensemble, uh, and they premiered um, eight new pieces. Um, so they commissioned eight composers to write pieces. Um, they were basically 
rearrangements, remixes of uh, uh, popular songs. So like Sheryl Crow and um, I'm trying to remember some of the others. But um, and they they commission composers from all around. Uh, there's one guy, Josh Shank, who's in Austin. Also Graham Reynolds and Carolyn Shaw, and um, there were there were a number of, of just sort of people from from all around. Um, so that was really cool. And they had kind of a band playing with them, like accordion, guitar, mandolin, kazoos, some drums, percussion. Uh, anyway, so. And uh, I mean, finally, so I'm now running down the whole list, so I've got to name the last one here. Um, we also had uh, Austin Soundwaves, which is uh, um, it's it's modeled after the uh, El Sistema Venezuelan El Sistema program uh, oh, yeah. in Austin. So it's a, a, a orchestra of kids, and uh, Hermes Camacho, a composer in Austin, wrote a piece for them and conducted them, and uh, that was uh, very cute and very cool. Um, anyway, so the, the festival was really awesome. I'm still beaming right now. I mean, this was just a month yeah. ago, and uh, and it was uh, it, it turned great. out. Yeah, it turned out it turned out wonderfully, and um, it was it was just a lot of fun, and um, yeah. and it was nice to get back to uh, back to the U.S. for a little while and get my fill of breakfast tacos. I, I ate tacos <laughs> literally every day. I was there. I was there for I think eight days. Tacos usually for like two meals a day. So <laughs> just. You can't you can't really get uh, tacos out here, and even uh, tortillas are kind of hard to find. You can get them at um, there's a place called Corte Inglés um, that's in a different town, and the tortillas come from the UK, which they aren't very good tortillas. Um, so, <laughs> so we've been a little deprived of uh, of Mexican, and there are no Mexican restaurants either. So, uh, uh, such a shame. I know. Yeah, I've been deprived of uh, so Mexican food here. I feel like we've kind of breezed through one. This, this is an eight-hour marathon thing, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. We kind of, I feel like we kind of brushed over that part. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder, so what is the experience like for the audience of a, an eight-hour marathon? It seems, I, and I know that you're certainly uh, in great company doing marathon concerts, but uh, I, I wonder why you choose to do the festival that way as opposed to a series of evenings uh say one hours over eight days that's a really good question and uh, we've discussed that at, at length and um as some of you may know austin is the land of many many festivals and um they're from and, and many of them are extremely big so like south by southwest acl austin city limits um uh, uh, fun, fun, fun fest. Have you guys, even, have you guys heard of that one? It's that actually, one. it's actually really big. Um, okay, cool. But uh, so these are all like popular music uh, festivals, of course. And uh, we've actually we curated a, a set at South by Southwest uh, two years ago in conjunction with Non Classical Records out of London. I was uh, going to ask about that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll get back to that in a minute. But the the, the marathon thing, I'm, I don't want to stray from the the the, uh, the original question because then I'll completely forget. Um, <laughs> So, turning Portuguese. I know. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this cup is actually full of wine. Um, <laughs> no, um, we one of the, the unique things about this festival, aside from the, the the music that that like the performance that we have, is that it's an, a marathon festival, and a lot of these are um, festivals that take place over several days. I mean, South by Southwest is one week, but it's like basically 18, 20 hours a day that there's music going on. And that's, uh, uh, there's also a um, Fusebox Festival. I don't know if you guys have heard about that one. That's a, it's an incredible, um, yeah. really incredible festival. But that's another one that is concerts and um, performances. That one encompasses, encompasses theater and performance art and lots of different things. But it's, uh, you know, every night for uh, Fusebox, I think it's two weeks. Um, so uh, part of what we wanted to do with ours is, is make it a little bit unique, kind of consolidate things. Um, and, and making an experience where people can just kind of spend the day coming and going and, and just hearing some new stuff. So they can come at, this year we started at uh, 4 p.m. They can come and hear the, you know, the first group, Living Earth show was first, I think, this year. Um, check that out. They can hear a little bit of the next one. If they're not that into it, they can go out in the lobby. They can have a beer. They can go, you know, uh, again, it all comes back to tacos. They can go and have tacos. Uh, <laughs> go, go to one of the, uh, uh, you know, taco trucks or... Um, and, and just kind of come and go the whole day, and and we want to make it a really comfortable thing where um, it has the atmosphere more like a, like a rock club or something where you just you're going to go and relax and have a good time. And if you want to sit on the floor, you can do that. If you want to like you know get up in between movements and go get another beer or whatever it is you want to do, um, I'm making it out like everybody's drunk at this thing. I swear they're yeah, not. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a party. 
we've okay. we've hung out with composers it, before. We know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, there, there is something about. I mean, I guess I keep coming get back to beer a lot, but uh, for me, that's very symbolic in a way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in in that, uh, it's something where this is a casual event where you can just relax and have a good time. This is not. Uh, um, you know, it's it's you're not going to be trapped in a concert hall. Which personally, I love going to hot concert halls. I love the acoustics of a of a of a great hall and hearing a great performance. Um, but a lot of people just don't really want to have anything to do with that. They want to um, just you know relax and and not feel trapped. So that's what we try to do with with fast forward. But um, you know, beyond that, we want to have a really wide variety of uh, performers. So we have stuff that's maybe a little bit more from like. Uh, like a jazz background, or a classical music background, or um, or rock, or performance art, or whatever, um, so that we we sort of cross pollinate these audiences as well, as well. So you know, a bunch of people will show up to hear, uh, you know, the Austin New Music Co-op, the people who are into like the European avant-garde stuff, or the minimalism, or what you know, the things that they do really well, and then they stick around and they hear. Um, you know, they hear like a string quartet uh, that's playing. You know. Bang in a can style stuff, you know, maybe more like New York school. Yeah, I hate saying New York school, but you know, like sort of new uh, music in a different realm. Uh, and Patrick likes not- it when you say New York school, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> he calls it the city school. The city. You don't know me. You don't know me. So, so they can they can stick around, hear something that they wouldn't have heard before, and, uh, and you know get get exposed to some new stuff. So hopefully we can kind of build audiences for these different performers. Um, people can hear a lot of new music. I mean that's that's the one common thread here is that everything is really new. Um, uh, music for eighteen musicians was by far the oldest piece that that was on the entire festival this year. I think almost every, I can't think of anything that was actually twentieth century except for that. I think everything else was twenty first century. So um, you know. The, it's uh, it's a chance for people to hear something there that they've never heard before and uh, and, and get it all in one place. Excellent. Well, great. so speaking of cross pollinating audiences, going back to the non classical curation you did for South by Southwest, I'm curious uh, as to how those pieces were received by that audience. Um, that went pretty well. Um, I think that um, it was a little tough um, because South by Southwest is just such a juggernaut that. You don't have any, like we didn't have any say in where we were going to play in, uh, like what day, what time, anything like that. It's just we're going to get a six-hour slot somewhere. Uh, we were also, um, we had, uh, there, were, there were back-to-back nights. We had like a sister concert with, uh, Anova uh, had a concert uh, the next night. Um, so I think this was a Friday, Saturday night thing. Um, and they, they brought in a bunch of artists and we had... Um, uh, Peter Gregson uh, is a cellist from London that it was uh, has just released a, an album and uh, non classical. It's it's all stuff written by um, um, uh, Gabriel Prokofiev. He's the uh, founder of non classical and um, uh, he actually, uh, without getting into too many details of the story, we met at South by Southwest um, previously. We had some mutual friends and he stayed with my wife and I. We had an extra room. But we didn't have an extra car, so it was just it was just the Harley and the Volkswagen, and my <laughs> wife had to go to work every day. So it was me and Gabriel Prokofiev like <laughs> zooming around town <laughs> in the Harley. Um, anyway, so after that, uh, we you know we, we talked a lot about uh, all these kinds of things because non classical is also uh, it's a label, it's a uh, it's a concert series, it does lots of things, and uh, we were talking about a lot of these ideas, and we decided to, to join up to do this. Um, uh, uh, to do this thing at uh, South by Southwest, and uh, the performer, the performances were great. I think the attendance was just—it wasn't quite as much as we were hoping for. Um, it, it wasn't bad though. I think you know, at any given time, maybe we had like sixty there, and we were in a smaller room, so it didn't feel uh, feel too bad. Uh, it didn't feel too uh, um, empty. But um, uh, they—I think they intentionally put us in a venue that was like off the beaten path because. It would be more quiet, and they saw the word classical, and that equal like, quiet. So, <laughs> right. so oh, it's going to be acoustic stuff. We'll put it. And you know, the night before, actually, Gabriel and I had went to check out the venue. Um, oh, no, no, no. This is uh, um, that was the year before. Uh, this last year, um, I think, I think it was Ian and I uh, went to check out the venue um, uh, the night before, and uh, and it was like you know, it was like uh, folk 
rock thing, like acoustic guitars and all that. So I think we, we got put in the quiet room, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which unfortunately meant we, were, we weren't we were on 6th Street. We were on the main drag uh, with a lot mm -hmm. of the other stuff. So we didn't get as much foot traffic. But we did get a, a lot of people showing up there. And uh, and it was, again, it was interesting just having uh, this like wide variety of stuff. And and, um, and actually one of the groups, uh, we had line, line Upon Line Percussion. And they were on, um, oh, the uh, what's the NPR... Um, Tiny concert, uh, tiny desk concert. Tiny desk. No, 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 no. They were um, all songs considered. They yeah. had their picks Ooh. for South by Southwest, and that was one of their picks. Was uh, mm. line upon line percussion, um, which was kind of cool. Um, well, I'm uh, looking at so, the, uh, the 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 uh, what is it the um, audio tracks that are embedded in the website for mm -hmm. you know your uh, fast forward Austin. Mm -hmm. um, and we've actually had Jerk Driver by Gabriel Prokofiev and A Man with a Gun Lives Here by Line yeah. on Line, uh, yeah, yeah. Line Upon Line Percussion as Picks of the Week. Yeah. That that what? just proves that we have our finger on the pulse. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, sh I should say this before uh, um, before we you know wrap things up. I, I was going to say this at the beginning, but uh, I actually listen to the podcast every week, and I have a, I have a long commute on the train uh, uh, here in Porto. It's about 45 minutes. Um, 45 minutes to the office uh, um, in uh, at Feup. Uh, Feup is the engineering school, and um, and so I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I always listen to uh, Sound Notion on uh, uh, usually Mondays or Tuesdays, and it's it seems like it's a good way for me to kind of keep up with what's going on in the in the U.S. and in, in the new music world, and to get to geek out with you guys for a little bit. So, mm -hmm. um, so international that. reach, baby. That That's right. Hey, <laughs> if you when we have sometimes we have particularly long episodes, and friend of the show James Holt has pointed out that if you listen to the audio version, you can still understand what we say and make it through faster if you have it play it like... <laughs> like he has it play one like... One and a half or two. One and a like half that. speed or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I do that with audiobooks. Yeah. Yeah, well, so... This has been a fascinating conversation, and I'm sorry that we have to, to cut it short a little bit, but let's get to uh, some of our uh, headlines, and then we'll get to our pick of the week at the end of the show, uh, which is a very cool piece. You should stick mm -hmm. around. If you were thinking about stopping, don't do that. <laughs> Think again. <laughs> Think again. <laughs> um, orchestra news. I know this is Sam's favorite part of the show. Right, Sam? Wah, wah, right? Wah. Yeah. Yes. I, I know this is your favorite part, and that's that's why I pointed out. Um, Minnesota is still not doing anything. There's no news there. They're still worthlessly ne not negotiating. Uh, however, <laughs> that's not going to happen in Seattle. Seattle just signed a new deal that takes them through 2015 without a work stoppage. So new CBA without a strike or a lockout. Congratulations, Seattle. Seattle, I believe, is in maybe their second year with their new music director, Ludovic Morlo. So it congratulations to those guys. What? Read about it on yes, adaptistration.com. Yes. Read all about it at adaptistration.com, and we'll have the links on our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash sn. Speaking of new music directors, Boston just announced that they have a new music director. Their new music director is a 34-year-old Latvian conductor, Andres Nelsons. So uh, finally getting around to replacing James Levine, who stepped down, what, two years ago now? Yeah, it was like a two-year search they went through. Bring to so. do the jobs Americans won't do. <laughs> no, I think probably an American would have agreed to do this one. Now. I think yeah, so. I would, I would have done it. <laughs> I was available. Is this no space? phone calls. Are you saying this Seriously. is like cheap labor or something? <laughs> 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 well, so congratulations to Boston and uh, Maestro Nelsons on that. Uh, I don't, do you guys have any any thoughts to share there? Nope. I, I, He's strong. I, I, I think we kind of already got that out, I suppose. Um, tech news. Some tech news. We do love mm. the technologies. Uh, this week at their developers conference, Google at Google I.O. announced a new streaming music service. Their new streaming <laughs> music service is cumbersomely titled Google Play Music All Access. And so, the acronym is pronounced KMA. Right. KMA. <laughs> is that Klingon? Decided on that earlier. <laughs> yeah, I think Google has kind of a... Google has Go ahead, kind of a please. knack for this, like the the Hangouts. I, I love, like we use Google Hangout for fast forward all the time. Yeah, um, it's it's really it's really wonderful, but it doesn't have that you know single syllable like Skype. Like you can use that as a verb. I'm going to Skype you, and it's yeah. like I'm going to Google Hangout you. <laughs> right, <laughs> so it just sounds really weird. Yeah. I'm going to hang you. No, that doesn't sound right either. It's not yeah. good. It's not good. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it's it's like any of the other streaming music services. It's all you can eat streaming. 
There is no free tier, which is a bummer. Um, but you can get a 30-day free trial, uh, and if you start your free trial before the end of June, the price is $7.99 a month. If you want to do it normally, it'll be $9.99 a month. I have started it. It's okay so far. It has all of the same problems that I have with Spotify, which I, I pay for already, um, it, which is, is it, that uh... The, uh, the metadata sucks, and you can't yeah. search for composers or anything like that. What were you going to say? That'll never be fixed. Is it like a different player than Google Music? No, it's the same. It's the Google Music player. So, so you, can, you, like, you use... can open up the Google Music player and play your tracks that are part of your Google Music account or stream if exactly. you have that service. That's exactly. cool. Exactly. So that's a cool feature of it, actually, is that it combines their cloud locker that they had before where you could upload your tracks to their cloud with their uh, streaming library. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, that's true. And you can, just like Spotify, you can kind of cache... Uh, things to your device or to your computer so you can like save a local copy if you know you're not going to have internet access or something like that and there's a track that you want to listen to you can save a local copy so that's kind of neat um, but like I said the the metadata thing is annoying speaking of the metadata thing being annoying another <laughs> streaming music service Rhapsody is trying to solve that problem uh, piece in the New York Times this week they announced that they are going to be adding what they refer to as a digital version of liner notes so it, it seems like this is not going to actually be the liner notes so if there was any special stuff that is in a very specific liner note you may not get that it's unclear at this stage but it should be rolling out sometime in the next few months um, well the other interesting thing in that article is talking that they were talking about changing what and other, uh, uh, making liner notes something else besides just like the information about what happened on that release, mm -hmm. which I want it to have all the data that I want, but uh, <clears throat> having it be a way that you can find other music that's related to what you're looking at by producer or by performer, that kind of stuff. There's mention so of you that want it kind to be of stuff. searchable. Yeah. And that's actually something that they don't say anywhere that it's searchable. That's a concern that I have is that it, it may not be as searchable. Like it's one thing to say, show me all the information about this track that I'm already listening to that I've already found. But right. I, I'm concerned that it will be hard to say, I would like to listen to music by, you know, Paul Hindemith or something like well, that. Well, also like the, the example they use in the article is saying, you know, if you're reading these, it doesn't say that it was produced by Quincy Jones, who has also produced all these. Awesome. So like, if they built in the ability, well, what albums has Quincy Jones produced, you know, so you can see what he's been responsible for as a producer. That's to me would be a cool thing. Yeah. And, and I, I got that impression from the article that we were reading that that might be a feature that like, <laughs> so I know this one thing by Quincy Jones. I want to find the other things by Quincy Jones too. Or they, they mentioned it specifically from this production company. Right. So I, yeah, I mean, Maybe that's maybe that's there. We'll have to we'll have to find out, I guess. Steve, yeah. do you use any of these streaming services? I um, used Spotify briefly when I was in the U.S. and then uh, when I moved to Portugal, we didn't right. have it here, and we just got it like a month and a half ago. So I have Spotify now. I don't have the premium. I just have the uh, basic account where the you know, they have these uh, you know advertisements that scream at me in Portuguese every two or three songs. <laughs> so. Are you it's a Portuguese language. speaker at all, by the way, Steve? I, um, I, I speak a little bit. I speak a little yeah. bit enough to be able to, um, like my my wife's family is in town actually right now, so they have to lug me around everywhere to to haggle <laughs> on, bathrooms. like when they're trying, yeah, when they try to find the bathroom or if they need to haggle about buying uh, some, you know, like placemats or whatever, or, or like at the restaurant. So it's it's enough to get by. But luckily, um, a lot of people in in Portugal speak English, so it's it hasn't been a problem. I was actually going to ask about that earlier. I'm, in Portugal and in Hong Kong, you got by speaking English just fine, I would imagine. Yeah, I, there are more people in Hong Kong that speak English than in Portugal, I would say, like a higher percentage, yeah. um, because it's just so, uh, um, uh, well, I mean, the, the British were there for so long. But uh, yeah, so it was pretty easy to get around. Sometimes people wouldn't speak English, but with them, it wasn't like I could sort of Fake it, uh, like you know, with the, with Latin-based languages, it's like okay, I'm going to keep trying some words here, and one of these is probably going to be similar to whatever your word is for this thing, and we'll figure it out. But when it's yeah. like Fido. Cantonese, when it's Cantonese, and one English, of these words like, is a cognate in Portuguese, so I'm just going to keep saying different things until yeah. I hit a cognate. Yeah, and just gesture wildly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. gesture goes far. I, just, I think Americans don't realize how good we have it 
uh, vis-a-vis the the amount of English that's spoken globally. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's been really um, amazing with that because it's it really is the. I mean, in my travels recently, it really is like the language that people go to if they want to communicate with somebody who speaks another language from their own, even if they, you know, it's like a, an Italian and. Uh, a uh, Chinese guy need to talk to each other. They speak to each other in English, um, mm-hmm. because that's mm-hmm. going to be most likely the common language that they that they share. Huh. Well, and uh, so one more piece of tech news, Dave. Yes, you you, you had a, a a particularly harsh reaction to this. I did because <laughs> I was so hopeful for it. So <laughs> Amazon, and I think they did this. This was like the day before the Google thing came out. Um, and I think they just wanted to have something out before the Google thing happened. Um, but they released a desktop client for their cloud player. So it will play your local files, and it will also play files that you have purchased. They don't have a streaming service, but it will also play files that you have purchased from the cloud on Amazon, which is great. It's a very, very cool thing, and it's going to hopefully... I mean, they, they're, they're positioning this thing as a replacement for iTunes. Uh, and the download is about a third the size of iTunes. Um, so that's great because the... iTunes like really bogs down your computer. It's got all kinds of bloated crap in it. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't have the newest PC that I run iTunes on. And as soon as I open iTunes, the fans come on <laughs> and like it's going <laughs> to blast off or something. I avoid yeah. iTunes at all costs. Yeah, it's really, really pretty annoying. But anyway, it's it's a very You're nicely talking to a designed. Win-Amp user I, here, pal. I get people who send me the <laughs> the the ten dollar um, like gift cards and things. Yeah, on I do too. Birthdays. It's like yeah. I want to use. I've got this. like thirty dollars <laughs> in iTunes gift cards that I've had for the last like three years. Yeah. Well, so you get them and then you download them and then you convert them to MP3 so that Winamp can play them for you. Right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So I downloaded this thing, and it's beautiful. It looks great. It looks, it looks way better than iTunes. It's much faster than iTunes. Not a resource hog like iTunes. Not a resource hog. I, it's, it seems great, except it will not show me the composer field in the metadata. And I cannot turn on the composer field in the metadata. So I'm totally messed up, and I was very upset because I thought this was going to save me, and then it turned out that it was not able to save me. I was very upset about that. So Shame. hopefully it will get better. But at the moment, it's a nice thing if you don't care about composers. Uh, and if you don't care about composers, why are you listening to my voice? And speaking <laughs> of not caring about composers, <laughs> we've lost Steven. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's probably had some, some, I don't know, Portuguese ISP problems. Or, yeah. So, uh, hopefully, we'll get him back. Uh, but uh, I guess the last bit of news that we have to talk about is uh, the passing of a, a great composer, Harold Shapiro, um, who was one of these um, kind of a Walter Piston uh, American twentieth century, mid twentieth century neoclassicist kind of Paul Hindemith school kind of thing he's he was called the the last of the aaron copeland generation yeah of American yeah that kinda... he was 93 when he passed just recently so he was he was get he didn't get ripped off as far as number of years to keep to keep composing yeah and i have to admit i had never i wasn't familiar with his music and then i listened to some piano music today and it was really Pretty cool good. yeah yeah i mean like i told dave it sounded like uh bach took some absinthe and composed a piano piece <laughs> Because so. yeah, it sounded very familiar, but took really strange turns also. Still and that's, interesting. That's, that's what you want from piano music, I feel. Yeah. Is, is, is Bach on absinthe. Bach yeah. on absinthe, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, are you back? I'm back. I'm yes. back. We get, do, do I get to use my... Uh, my... <laughs> <laughs> that is very uh. good-natured cat, by the way. How? He doesn't look happy, but he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it time, Dave? Well, I think so. Yeah. Let's uh, let me stop this, and then you can, Sam, <laughs> hit it. <laughs> How was that? How was that? I How think was that? that was I think wonderfully that was, overdriven. That yeah. was a new thing. Yeah, that was a new thing you just did there. Using wow. physical object and processing. I, I see that. I, I, 
couldn't even understand any of it. <laughs> I'll assume that you just announced that we're going into the pick of the week because we're going to go into the pick of the week now. Uh, are, um, so, Nate, I'll, I, or, well, so Nate, I'll let you introduce the, uh, the, the pick of the week this week. Uh, or maybe I should let Steve do it himself. Um, this is a piece for string quartet uh, and electronics, right? Well, I, I don't say electronics because I don't want to scare people off. Uh-oh. So I just say it's string quartet. <laughs> because really, in performance, it's just a, a, a like a battery-powered speaker and an iPod or a boombox. That's been done before, too, with a cassette tape. Yeah. Um, and and do, you the, say, do you say Appalachian or do you say Appalachian? I say Appalachian. Okay. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not. That's I, the I'm, right I'm, way to say it. I'm a hillbilly from the Ozarks, so uh, <laughs> I'm, you know it's a little different. I, I mispronounce everything anyway. So Th- them are my folks over there. <clears throat> yeah. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee, originally. <laughs> oh, right on. Okay. So like the very, very tail end of the Appalachian Mountains. So yeah. you say Appalachian? I do. Megan makes fun of me for it, though. All right. <laughs> so anyway, sorry to interrupt you. I was just want to make sure we were on the same page there. All right, so the uh, Appalachian, now I have to think about how to pronounce it. Uh, (laughs) um, So, yeah, the uh, Appalachian Polaroids. This this is a piece written for a group called the Aeolus String Quartet, and um, uh, they they performed a piece of mine, uh, a piano quintet, actually, uh, a while back, and wanted uh, wanted something for their album. So this is is on their album, Many Sided Music, uh, that was released Mm in 2012, I think. Um, and, uh, yeah, this piece is, uh, we're, we're going to hear, I think about a minute and a half of it. Um, and it uses a, um, recording of like a, uh, old field recording of, of someone, uh, uh, Sheila Adams, her name's Sheila Adams singing a folk song. I think she, I think this was recorded in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and, uh, they actually play along with it for a little bit and then it sort of diverges from there. And the piece is all about sort of taking these subtle vocal gestures and expanding them, making them sort of musically um, more intertwined with everything else. So, for instance, like taking these little yols at the ends of phrases and really expanding those into these big slides and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I said, um, it's been performed before with actually just like a, a little battery-powered boom box and the cellist or whoever wants to push play, I guess, just pushes play on the tape and then they play along with it for a bit and then the recording stops and they keep going. Yeah, Nate pointed out before we started that uh, you mentioned that in the in the performance notes that it could be played on like a phone or something like with a phone or tablet speaker. Right. Yeah, I think it could be. It, it has been done before. It's been done with a laptop and it's been done with a phone. It wasn't an iPhone. It was something else. I mean, but, it's kind um, of lo-fi source material, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's also, it's not meant to be, um, it's meant to be very soft. So, um, I mean the, the rest of the uh, ensemble has to really come down quite a bit to let it show through. But you know, one of the points of it also is that the, the, the live performers sort of overwhelm the recording by the end of it. So you'll hear this, how that sort of works out in this. The, the uh, recording in, in the, like the full piece, this is all that, that, that exists of the recording in the performance. So once it's done in the excerpt that we hear, then, that's, then the rest of it is just string quartet. So okay. okay. We should mention this is Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair is the tune. That's yes. correct. Right. Yeah. And it's weird that, uh, you know, David Maslanka has used this in a piece, and I have actually done a choral arrangement of this piece. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's, it, a barrio, there's a Barrio piece also. Um, oh, I, mean, I can't remember. I heard a new, new, music, som- uh, new music ensemble at UT play that, um, that used this same song as well. It's a good song. Well, that, pro- that proves my – I said there is something attractive about this piece that draws people in, and if Barrio did it, then you know. Well, hey, then, then it's for <laughs> serious. That's for so serious, let's yeah. let's go ahead and give it a it's listen. For Syria. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I see what you did there, Steve. Oh. oh. Let's go ahead and give it a listen. This is uh, I'm going to go with Appalachian Polaroids by our guest Stephen Snowden. This is this is an excerpt from the beginning of the piece. Black is the color of my true love's hair. His face is light. With the prettiest face and the neatest hand I love the ground where on each stand I love my love and well he knows I love the ground where on he goes If you know my 
that was an excerpt from uh, a piece by our guest called Appalachian Polaroids, uh, performed by that was recording was by the Aeolus Quartet, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that with us, Steve. That was great. Um, I, I love the uh, the the string quartet matching the the style and the the fiddling kind of thing. Does that does they do they keep the fiddling style after that recording goes away? Yeah, they do. They do. It's. Uh, I mean, it gets a little bit more, uh, a little crunchier as it goes. Um, uh, a little bit more um, active. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, they. It's. It's sort of like taking that style, the subtle things about it, like maybe uh, the sort of like repeated double stops that you'd get in uh, in fiddling or these slides, and making them sort of stretching them out, making them more extreme as they as they go. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. So it maintains that kind of uh, style throughout the. Steve, I think that's a beautiful piece. And, and you know, I've thought a lot about how to um, invoke that kind of sound in, you know, art music. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, and I think you did a beautiful job of it there. I'm actually quite jealous. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm working on a piece right now for piano and clarinet. I, I've promised my wife for years I'll write her a piece, and I'm working on one right now that tries to invoke that kind of, you know, hillbilly music sound, you know. And it's... Mm-hmm. It's figuring how to do it in an art music context is not the easiest thing in the world. Yeah, it's tough, and and for me, I feel like um, that that music is more familiar to me than classical music. I didn't even really listen. That was not a part of my childhood at all, like music lessons or anything. Um, I got started really late, um, and uh, and I grew up in in the country, you know, in a small town for part of my childhood, and then like liter- literally out in the middle of uh, uh, like the middle of the countryside. Um, next to a creek, uh, um, I spent most of my childhood. So uh, I usually listen to most of what I heard was classic rock, actually, because my uh, dad worked construction, and I would go work with him all the time. We'd be Blair and Leonard Skinner, and um, you know, working all day. And uh, um, and then you know, a lot of this this kind of stuff. The live music I would hear would be uh, like bluegrass. That was most common, or bluegrass or country type stuff. And um, in some ways, it feels more natural to me. It's like I'm, I've been working on developing these skills as a as a composer and working in this certain way. Um, but I've always it's always sort of resting on this foundation of like classic rock and bluegrass, I guess, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> I feel similarly, actually. You know, I grew up with a classic rock station, and you know they have like the eighty songs that they play are that the heart yeah. of classic rock. <laughs> Although the, lately, the thing I've been noticing is like the Bee Gees are like now included in like the classic rock stations oh, right. playlist. I'm like, when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ours was always uh, US ninety seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out of, out of Springfield, I, Missouri. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I grew up the, the same same way. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ours <clears> was ninety four nine. I don't remember what the name was. And you, and you and and all of that stuff found its way into your string quartet. That's awesome. That's right. <laughs> this is the culmination. Now. Right. <laughs> so it, it's an indication of how much fun we've had talking to Steve today that we do not realize that we're like an hour and 20 minutes <laughs> into, into our show already. So we're going to have to leave this there. But Steve, thank you so much for making the time to join us from from all the way in in Portugal. We really appreciate it. Uh, oh, sure. it's been Thanks. great talking to you. Yeah, it's been great talking to you guys too. I'm glad I'm glad I was able to uh chat with you for a little while here. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm glad we we made the schedule work. Um so uh you should check out Steve's stuff, uh his website and the links to all the things that we talked about today and all of his projects that we talked about today are going to be up in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash sn. So be sure to go there and check out uh all these all these great things that Steve's got going on and all these cool uh tech things that we talked about today if you have any thoughts about them you can get in touch with us there soundnotion.tv slash sn or you can uh like us on facebook subscribe to us on youtube follow us on twitter we're at sound notion on twitter i'm at dave mcdo sam is at house Goy. patrick is at vox shibuya nate is at a nate tree and steve is at steven snowden that's steven with a v snowden uh on twitter um i'm sure you you have that confusion a lot steve yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you can, if you'd like to support our show, tell your friends, uh, use our Amazon affiliate search thing on our site, uh, or you can donate to us there as well. Our introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. When we will have Daniel Spreadbury, who is working on this, this successor 
to Sibelius at Steinberg, uh, and he'll tell us all about it. So if you if that's something you're interested in, tune in next week. <laughs>